All right, we're in Judges chapter 10, which is approximately the halfway mark through our study in the book of Judges. And I'd be, like to begin reading in verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 16. And it says this, and after Abimelech, such welcome words after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, uh, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jer, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities, which are called Havoth Jer unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jer died and was buried in Camon. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord, and served not him. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines, and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side, Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God, and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon, from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites, did oppress you, and you cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word uh, to us uh, this morning. And of course, this chapter is about uh, two of what we would sometimes refer to as minor judges, Tola and Jer. And then it really ends the chapter with the need of a man. Uh, you see in verse 18, he says, the people, princes of Gilead, said one to another, what man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Tola, Jair, and then the need of a man. Now, what is very interesting about this chapter um, is that it, it really is about to bring us into the the judgeship of Jephthah. It's kind of an, an introductory chapter, setting the scene for Jephthah. Uh, Jephthah lived approximately 1,100 years before Christ. And there are 59 verses that are devoted to Jephthah for six years of judging. You'll notice in chapter 12 and verse 7, it just mentions Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. And so you have 59 verses that will be taken up with the judgeship of Gilead. And yet Tola, as we're going to see uh, this morning, he judged Israel uh, for 23 years. And he's, he's just given two verses of the inspired text, verse 1 and 2. Uh, uh, and then uh, we'll see that following him is Jer, who judged Israel for 22 years, and he gets just three verses by contrast. And so that's, there's obviously an important lesson to learn from Jephthah if these other judges are given such scant attention, and he is given so many uh, verses uh, to uh, us to ponder concerning him. 
So obviously there's things the Lord wants us to understand. But we really need to be careful. We, we do tend to say that Toller and Jair are minor judges. And what we mean by that is the same way we talk about the minor prophets. Minor, not in the sense of their spiritual stature or their usefulness to God, but just minor in the amount of text that is devoted to them. So when we talk about the minor prophets, it's because usually they're much shorter than the major prophets, but it doesn't mean that their message was insignificant. In fact, as we studied together uh, the books Zechariah and Malachi, we saw that they are very significant messages, but they just use less space uh, to communicate it. So again, it would be unfair to say that Tola and Jair uh, were minor in terms of their impact, just in terms of the amount of text that's devoted to them. In fact, uh, what we would say is that their service together spanned a period of 45 years, uh, 23, Tola, Jair, 22. So put it together, 45 years. And so a combined service of 45 years and a period of seemingly unprecedented peace and stability for the nation of Israel. And so they certainly could not be called minor men of God. Uh, they had a profound influence over the nation for that 45-year period. They kept Israel's enemies away for nearly half a century, which would suggest that they were faithful men who served the Lord and the nation well. Right, just amazing. Forty-five years, no enemy mentioned, no attacks on the on the nation of Israel, no mention of idolatry, and they came on the scene at a very uh, after a very turbulent time. Notice how it begins in verse one, and after Abimelech, and we've just witnessed the the chaotic period of Abimelech's. Uh, time uh, when he uh, thrust himself forward to be the leader in the nation. And so there was a, a vacuum, a void after his death, and this was filled by these two men. And after all the tumult and all the chaos, they brought a time of quietness and peace and security for the children of Israel that lasted for this 45-year period. And so their contribution was absolutely immense. Indeed, they're uh, unique uh, in the book of Judges, because normally, if you remember, there's a pattern. There's a, a judge who rules, and then after that judge dies, what happens? Children of Israel rebel, right? And they go back to their idolatry, and then there's another judge comes on the scene. Well, here we have two judges that are back-to-back -back and no rebellion recorded in between. And so Tola passed on a stable, as it were, judgeship to the next judge, Jer, and he came into that judgeship, and there was just tranquility. There was no, no rebellion, no attacks, nothing like that. And so it, it, it really is unique because normally we've seen this pattern. The judge dies, and then there's chaos. And so they maintain stability and peace for 45 continuous years, which bears testimony to their positive impact. Idolatry did not raise its head again until after the death of Jair. And we read in verse six, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And so for that 45 years, they were successful, not only in maintaining peace, but also in keeping the people from idolatry for 45 years. So these are a giants, really. They had a profound impact for 45 years. So we want to think about, first of all, the deliverance of Israel in verses 1 through 5 under these two judges. And then we'll consider the distress of Israel from verse 6 to the end of the chapter. The deliverance of Israel and the distress of Israel. And so it says in verse 1, after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel. Again, why did the King James translators use the word defend Israel uh, when they were describing Tola? Because normally that word is translated save or deliver. But they, in their consummate wisdom, decided to use the word defend instead. 
And the reason is because as far as we know, Tola didn't deliver Israel from any invading army, nor did he save them from a foreign power. But he managed to defend Israel from invasion. And so this quite wise in their choice of word. Uh, when they said Israel rose to defend his, uh, Abimelech, they rose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pur. And uh, he dwelt in Shamir, it says, in Mount Ephraim. Now, we have no idea where that is. Nobody's ever been able to find Shamir other than it's in the area of Ephraim, uh, of the tribe of Ephraim. And so that's where he did his judgeship and Shamir, we do know what it means. It means a thorn, which is kind of interesting. Uh, after uh, Abimelech, the bramble king, uh, this man takes up his residence in a town called the thorn and, uh, and yet was able to bring pre peace. And so it says he judged Israel verse two, 20 and three years and died and was buried in Shamir. So he undertook the vital and demanding work of actually promoting and maintaining conditions that were conducive to peace. And such believers are so, so important in the Lord's work today. There are always those among us who are intent in stirring up strife. There's plenty of them around, right? They love conflict. It seems like they thrive on conflict and uh, they, they just are spoiling for a fight. And yet how marvelous to have brethren who the Lord says, blessed are the peacemakers. Now, not peace at any price. He's not compromising. We don't see any evidence of anything negative about him, but he's a man who is a man of peace, who maintains peace for 23 years. And so we thank God uh, in our assemblies for times of peace where there's no strife, there's no conflict, there's no, <clears throat> those of us that have been in, in assemblies where they've been uh, torn by strife. It's a miserable time. It's a, it's a very trying time for the people of God. And how wonderful it is to be in conditions that are peaceful. Uh, where there's harmony amongst the saints and and everything is is going well. And so we thank God for the men like Tola. He promoted and preserved law and order in the land and no mean feat after the time of Abimelech's reign. And I really believe that this man Tola really was a gift from God for the nation after that tumultuous time to enter into a time of peace in this man, Tola, was responsible for that. Now, a very a couple of interesting scriptures we want to consider. First of all, the book of Proverbs in chapter 29, Proverbs 29 and verse 2. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people rejoice mourn. And so obviously this man, it seems that he was a, a godly man. He was a stable man. He was a righteous man. And there was a period of unprecedented peace. And we read that he was a man of Issachar from the tribe of Issachar. And of course, we're, we're reminded if, if we know anything about the tribe of Issachar, and many of us, uh, they're not a tribe that naturally comes to our mind. But if there's any scripture that we relate in our minds to Issachar, it's First Chronicles 12 and verse 32, where it says, the children of, Is of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. <laughs> and we often talk about that, men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. And here's a man of Issachar, who understood the times. He knew that they, they had just gone through this turbulent time. He knew that there was a great need for peace and stability, and he was the man of the hour, and he displayed wisdom in understanding the times and knowing what Israel ought to do, and so he was able to, to do that. Now, his name Tola is interesting because it means worm. You wonder what gets into the minds of parents sometimes when they name their children. And uh, 
uh, can you imagine calling your child worm hey worm come here you know i mean we we would really think that would be a terrible name to call a child but that's what he was called his name means worm and it's suggestive of his lowly character it's, and of course that's vital in godly leadership isn't it uh, to be clothed with humility remember how peter said that in first peter 5 uh, that, that those that lead God's people, they need to be humble men. And so uh, how fitting that a lowly man, somebody who's known as a worm, should follow Abimelech, my father is king, somebody who was arrogant and proud and uh, filled with strife. Here's this lowly man. And of course, Tola, as we are already, I'm sure, thinking um, in our minds, points to Another who was also known as a worm. Psalm 22 in verse 6, speaking of the Lord Jesus, but I am a worm, uh, that's the word tolat, and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. And again, we think of the humility, the lowliness of the Lord Jesus. And what is he? He is the Prince of Peace. And those that take his yoke upon them, uh, they they will have rest for their souls. And so uh, very, very fitting. Also, it's kind of interesting that this word uh, tola is also uh, translated as crimson in Isaiah 1 and verse 18. Uh, you know, come let's reason together. Uh, though your sins are scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And so that's, again, the same word. And also in Lamentations 4 and 15, uh, the same word is translated as scarlet, which is interesting. And there's a reason for that, uh, because <clears throat> the, the taller worm was used to extract a red dye that was used in clothing. And so it's not only a worm, but it's a worm that is famous for its crimson or scarlet dye. And one of the things about this worm that we know, and it's kind of fascinating to, to look at uh, how kind of science uh, kind of helps us understand uh, the Bible in some ways, uh, in, in that uh, it throws light on Scripture without changing uh, Scriptures to suit science. But when science affirms Scripture, it's always very interesting. And so when the female of this scarlet worm species, the taller worm species, was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she could never leave again. So she would attach herself there. And then the eggs that were deposited beneath her body were thus protected under uh, the larva, which hatched and was able to enter into its own life cycle. And as the mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body and the surrounding wood. So you've got this wood with crimson all around where the taller worm is, has made this, and of course it's younger underneath. And so the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted from this. And what a picture it gives us of the one who said, I am a worm and no man, how Christ attached himself to the tree until the work was done and until he could bring forth many sons to glory. And <laughs> he was firmly fixed to that tree, uh, as it were. Nothing would bring him down until he'd accomplished his purpose, and he could bring many sons with him to glory. And so what a beautiful idea of Tola. And so Tola lived out his quiet and humble testimony in the territory of Ephraim. Notice, although he's a man of Issachar, verse 1, he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. Now, we've also come across the Ephraimites in our study, and we've noticed that they were very proud and arrogant. <laughs> and uh, it, it, they, remember, they were the ones who first tested Gideon. And they, they came, and why have, have you served us this way? Why did you not call us when you went to fight Midian? 
uh, and he pacified them by making much of what they had done and minimizing what he had done. And so this prideful tribe was, uh, he chose that for his residence, uh, even though he's a man of Issachar, and he was able through his quiet testimony uh, it's amazing they didn't drive him out because he was so contrary to them. They were they were people that were confrontational and proud, and and he wasn't anything but that. They didn't drive him out, and it would suggest that perhaps even his quiet testimony may have had a favorable impression upon them, and may have produced a softer spirit amongst them. And so when he died, he left behind conditions of unity and peace amongst the people of God. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful in a sense that uh, when our responsibility to the people of God in our generation is past, that we leave behind us, not strife, not contention, not chaos, but we leave behind conditions that are suitable for peace. <laughs> that would be a real blessing. And uh, certainly this is what this man did. So along comes Jer next after him. And again, no period of rebellion. It's immediately afterwards. After him arose Jer, a Gileadite, and judged Israel 20 and two years. And Jer, his name means enlightener, which is suggestive of one who brought light during what was often dark days in the nation of Israel. And so you've had this period of peace and you've got this period of light. And it's just a beautiful time uh, of 45 years of uninterrupted peace. And so, again, we're reminded again of the Lord Jesus, just as Tola, in his humility, the worm reminded us of the Lord Jesus. I'm a worm and no man. And so now this one called Enlightener reminds us of the one who says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And so, again, both men would point to Christ and they would produce peaceful conditions. And of course, the Lord Jesus is the Prince of Peace and, of course, brings peace to a troubled world, a world that's been devastated by the Amalek prideful conditions. And yet here comes these men and their peace men, and they bring conditions that are suitable for peace. And again, his, it would seem that his judgeship was marked by harmonious relationships. Because it says, uh, Jer, a Gileadite, he judged Israel 20 and two years, and he had 30 sons and that rode on 30 ass cults, and they had 30 cities, which are called Havoth Jer unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And it would seem that his 30 sons, he had peace in the family, that they worked with him in maintaining this realm of peace. Uh, they, had, they rode on asses colts. Now, again, asses colts is a symbol of peace. Uh, the Lord Jesus rode into Jerusalem, what did it call the fall of an ass. When he comes at his second advent, what does he come riding? A white horse. You see, a horse would speak of war. It's a war horse. He's coming to, to fight against his enemies. But the first time, in fact, the Lord said to Jerusalem, if only you had known the days for your peace, if they've only known that that it would have been a different story. And so these asses' colts were a symbol of peace, whereas horses were a symbol of war. And so it's possible they rode on them from city to city to assist their father in imparting wisdom, administering justice, and promoting peace. So he had peace in the family. These sons were working in harmony with their father and peace in the nation. And so these 30 cities were called cities of Jair. Now, no doubt, each one of them was different, and yet there was a unity about them, and they reflected the character of the man whose name they, they bore. And so, again, there's this period of stability, this period of peace, and then it says in verse 5, and Jair died and was buried in Camon. So that would bring to, to an end this lovely period of 45 years of uninterrupted harmony and peace and quietness. Now, and what, a, a again, a gift from God after the turbulent time of Abimelech to enter into this period of 45 years 
of uninterrupted peace and good leadership, good leadership that set a good example and managed to keep people from idolatry, keep people from conflict, uh, tremendous. And, and again, isn't it wonderful when you have godly leaders who are humble men and their quiet influence keeps the people of God from going after idolatry, wasting their lives on things that don't satisfy, and also is able, are able to defend the assembly, as it were, from, from attack from the evil one. And you say, that's a life well lived. This, this is a, well, a life to be commended, right? A, a man that can do that. And so we certainly would pray for that. We pray for godly shepherds that can produce peace amongst the people of God, give stability to the saints, and prevent attacks from the evil one. And we'd say, what has that man done? Well, maybe that he didn't, you know, kind of win any dramatic battles, but on a daily level, he was able to have a profound influence for God. So we get to verse 6. And I want to suggest to you, we're now entering into a time of complete apostasy. Because you'll notice that there are seven gods that they go after, which is that number seven is the idea of completeness, fullness. Um, and so they've, they've, they've gone over completely to idolatry. Notice it says the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and they served Balaam and Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, Zidon, Moab, the children of Ammon, the Philistines, they forsook the Lord and served not him. And isn't it amazing how Israel, throughout the book of Judges, they're either blowing hot or cold throughout that period, often more cold than hot. And they're, they're, they're a up and down spiritually. They're, sometimes they're zealous, and, and sometimes they allow the world and the flesh to come in and dominate them. And it's a bit like us. You know, we're, we're like that too. Sometimes we have great zeal for the Lord, and sometimes we succumb to the flesh and all the rest of it. And all for more consistency in our lives, for more consistent devotion to the Lord, and the things of eternity. And oh, that's what we need, isn't it? We need that consistent daily devotion to the Lord. Stop being spiritual yo-yos, up and down, up and down. This is what's going on with Israel. They're constantly blowing hot and cold, and it's just like us. And so all for more consistent devotion to the Lord and the things of eternity. And so <clears throat> he mentions uh, the various gods that they went off after, uh, as well as Baal and Ashtoreth, he talks about the gods of Syria. And again, we know from the, the gods of Syria, uh, uh, Rimon would have been one of the gods of Syria. We know that from the st story on, in Second Kings uh, chapter 5, and Naaman the leper. And he said that, you know, when, when I go back, can you give me some earth? Because when my master goes in to worship the god of Rimon, <laughs> and so, of course, uh, that was the gods of Syria, Rimon, gods of Zidon, uh, that would be Ashtoreth, uh, 1 Kings 11, in verse 5, uh, we read about, about uh, Zidon's gods. Uh, Moab, uh, from Jeremiah 48, we lear learned that Moab worshipped Chemosh, and that was their deity. And then Ammon, uh, in 1 Kings 11, again, they worshipped Molech, uh, that horrible deity that demanded human sacrifice, babies being sacrificed to Molech, and also Milcom. And then, of course, the gods of the Philistines would be Dagon. And so basically... All of these different deities, the children of Israel went after and worshipped, but it says they forsook the Lord and served not him. They were worse, in a sense, than the men of Athens. Now, remember the men of Athens, they had all these uh, various kind of shrines to their various deities, and at least they had one for the unknown God. Uh, there was room there for, for an unknown God, but, but here, Israel, there's no room whatsoever uh, for the God who had done so much for them. They had just eliminated him completely. Even though they enjoyed 45 years of peace and prosperity, 
but they didn't take time to thank the Lord for what he had done for them in giving them stable leadership and giving them this time of peace. And of course, the essence of idolatry is enjoying God's gifts, but not being grateful to the giver in Israel was guilty of that. They enjoyed all of the blessings that God had brought to them, but they were, well, as it says in Romans chapter one, neither were they thankful. And then that downward spiral of idolatry developed. And how important it is for us uh, to be thankful people, to constantly be thanking the Lord for all his benefits. And I think that will keep us from a heart of idolatry. I think it's really critical that we'll be thankful people, but they failed and they immersed themselves in this sevenfold idolatry that reflected the foreign gods from across the entire land of Canaan. And again, we said it's the number of completeness in scripture in number seven. And so uh, at the midpoint of the book of Judges, the judges that God had raised up to deliver the children of Israel had not produced any lasting changes. It only happened for a while. And then the children of Israel returned to their idolatry. And now at the midpoint, they have returned to it in completeness as it were, and given themselves over uh, to seven uh, different gods that they were serving. And it says the anger of the Lord, verse seven, was hot against Israel. And you can understand why. After all he's done for them, how quickly they turn away from him. And it says that the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. Now, this is kind of interesting because it's set in the scene, really. So there's, there's two enemies that he sold them into, the Ammonites and the Philistines. The Ammonites are coming to them from the east. They're coming across the Jordan, as it were, where they, they're beginning in the land of Gilead, and then they're going to come across into the land of Israel from the east. The Philistines are in the west. And the two are going to be coming against Israel. And what are they going to be doing? They're going to be squeezing them. They're going to be putting pressure on Israel because of their idolatry. And in chapters 11 and 12, we're primarily going to be taken up with the Ammonites. And God is going to raise up Jephthah against the Ammonites. And then when we get to chapter 13, We're going to focus on the Philistines and Samson, Sonny, is going to be raised up to deal with the Philistines. But nevertheless, we want to just see that really almost at the same time, there's this pressure pot put on the children of Israel. And it's the Lord who's bringing it again because of their rebellion. And so we're focused on the Ammonites in this chapter and in chapters 11 and 12. And so we just need a reminder, we've already visited with them in chapter three uh, of the chapter. We know a little bit about them. They're the, um, like the Moabites. Um, they were descendants of Lot and the incestual relationship with Lot's two daughters. And so there's nothing spiritual about their origins. They came out of a fleshly union with Lot and his two daughters. And so like Moab, uh, they represent the power of the flesh on the life of a believer. And it was really fleshly lusts of the children of Israel that had led them to forsake the Lord and to serve the gods of the land. And we've said it before, but we're just good to remind ourselves that why were the gods of the land so attractive to them, even though the Lord had defeated these nations? Why were they so attractive? Well, because they were connected with fertility and sexual immorality. And so there was a tremendous appeal to the flesh in going after these deities. And so it really was a flesh-driven activity was their idolatry. So the Lord uses, as it were, a people who are the product of the flesh, uh, the Ammonites, to punish them because he simply gave the people over 
to them to reap what their rebellion had sown. And so that's exactly what is taking place here. And so it says in verse 8, um, it says, that, And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel, 18 years, and all the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. So that year, the very year that they gave themselves over to this unbridled idolatry after the death of Jair, that year, again, it's instantaneous, the year the oppression began was the year that they drove into idolatry. It says they vexed. Now, this word vexed, it means harassed. It, it means dashed in pieces. It's very strong language. And they oppressed, again, that of cracking, bruising, crushing. And so uh, this, the language implies, reveals how serious things had become. Uh, the, the, the pressure on them, they were, they were crushing blows from the, the Ammonites that came against them. And again, we've said the Philistines perhaps would also be putting pressure on them from the West, but we're just dealing with the, the East at this time. But again, they're under tremendous pressure uh, because of their sin and rebellion. And it says in verse nine, moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin, against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. And so they not only had dealt with the tribes on the other side, Jordan, in the land of Gilead, but they actually came across Jordan and, and came into the central part of the land uh, with forays and attacks, attacks emboldened by the victory that, that they'd experienced on the other side, Jordan. They came and they just kept coming and kept coming. And the enemy's like that. You give him an inch and he'll take a mile. He's never just satisfied with a little victory. He'll keep on keeping on until he takes more and more territory. And so we must not yield even an inch, because if you yield an inch, he'll take a mile. And that's the way the enemy works. And so as a result of this, it says that the children of Israel in verse 10 cried unto the Lord, saying, we have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And this time they give a detailed confession which is good. It's good that they're, they're being perfectly frank. God wants honesty. He, he, he appreciates the honesty when people tell him, Lord, I have sinned and get specific, not in generalities, but specific. And so they cried to the Lord saying, we have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam twofold, right? We've uh, not just Balaam, uh, others too, the Zidonians, the Amalekites, the Mayanites, we, we've done all this. And so they, they basically are quick to uh, acknowledge their sin. And they're admitting that it's twofold, not only forsaking God, but going into idolatry. So the Lord reminds them that they've gone after seven different deities, and he had delivered them from seven different enemies. And so he begins to list them. And so it says, the Lord said to the children of Israel, did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, Amorites, children of Ammon, Philistines, Zidonians, the Amalekites, the Mayanites, seven different enemies. Some suggest the Mayanites is a reference to the Midianites uh, that were during the time of Gideon. But basically, the Lord had delivered them from seven different enemies, and yet what was their gratitude for his deliverance from seven different enemies? They went and worshipped the gods of seven nations that the Lord had conquered. The Lord had given victory over seven different nations, but Israel was worshipping seven different variety of pagan gods. No wonder God's anger was hot against Israel. I mean, what foolishness to worship the gods of your defeated enemies. But you see it again and again. And again, I've just been reading through Kings and Chronicles. And uh, oftentimes uh, the kings would go and worship the deities of nations they'd actually conquered. And again, what stupidity, what folly. But sin, as we said last time, is insanity. There's an insanity 
in sin. And certainly these people are behaving in an insane way. And then he says, the Zidonians, also the Amalekites and the Mayanites, verse 12, did oppress you and you cried to me and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet, after all I have done for you, how have you responded? Verse 13, yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. This was a devastating message for the nation of Israel. For the people to abandon God was one thing, but for God to abandon them was quite something else. I will deliver you no more. And I believe that one of the greatest judgments that God can possibly bring upon a people is abandoning them. Romans chapter 1. Let's just turn there for a moment. But again, because of just what we're saying here, that the lack of gratitude of a people, God does something. They're rejecting light that they've clearly received. In Romans one twenty four, they read these words, wherefore, in the light of their lack of thankfulness, in the light of their going after idolatry rather than worshiping the God of creation that has revealed himself to them, it says, wherefore, God also gave them up. Verse 26, for this cause, God gave gave them up. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. And it is a terrible, terrible thing to experience abandonment by God. And it was too much for the Jews. And so they actually did something that they had not done before. And I want you to notice what they do. When God says, I'll deliver you no more, he, then he says in verse 14, go and cry to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And again, he, he's he using the exact same language that Gideon's father. Remember when uh, the, uh, the grove was torn down and Baal's image was torn down and all the rest of it. And of course, uh, they say, well, put, put Gideon to death. And, and then... What did uh, Gideon's father say? He said, let Baal plead for himself. You know, if he's God, let him uh, help. And so God says, okay, if you have uh, gone over to these gods um, and you've forsaken me, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. Go and cry to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And of course, we know from other stories in the Bible, like the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel, that these other gods have defective hearing, right? They're, they can't hear and they can't do anything because they're just dumb idols. And so he says, go and cry to them. Let's let them deliver you in your time of tribulation. And so it says in verse 15, the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And I, I like that. You notice what they say, Lord, deliver us this day. There's an urgency in their prayer, right? They've had 18 years of this when they're crying to the Lord. Uh, remember verse 8. They vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. And so after 18 years of being squeezed, they're desperate for deliverance. They, they, they're feeling the consequence of their rebellion. They confess it to the Lord, and then they cry out and say, Lord, whatever you do, deliver us and do it now, this day. There's, there's that sense of urgency. Now, they should not have been surprised in a sense that God had said, I'm not going to deliver you. I abandon you. Because if you look back to Deuteronomy, just for a second, Deuteronomy chapter 31, we're going to see something very interesting here that uh, Moses taught them in a song. 
In Deuteronomy 31 and verse 16 and 17, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Am I in the right chapter here? Yeah. And this people will rise up and go whoring after other gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I'll hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And, of course, this was all to be written in a song. Look at, notice verse 21. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that this song shall testify against them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouth of the seed. For I know their imaginations, which they go about even now, before I have brought them into the land, which I swear. Moses, therefore, wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children of Israel. But evidently that song had become dim in their ears and they weren't paying attention to it anymore. And so this current generation had forgotten that God said, if you forsake me, I'll forsake you. And so they cry out in desperation. And then they do something, as we've said, that they had not done before. It says in verse 16, it says, and they put away the strange God's from among them and served the Lord and his soul was grieved for the misery of the children of Israel. So for once, their words were backed up by positive actions. This is not just remorse. We're sorry because we're in the mess we're in. But now there's evidence that they're actually doing something to put away the sin. Right, So there's genuine repentance now. But it's interesting that it's not the sincerity of their repentance that God responds to. I want you to notice what he responds to. It says, they put away the strange gods from among them, serve the Lord. But then it says this, verse 16, the end, his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Their hope was not in their repenting or their praying but in the character of God. His soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Uh, Isaiah 63, 9 says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Right? In all their affliction, he was afflicted. See, this is not a cold and heartless God who was chastising his people. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And the children of Israel had lost all feelings for him, the charge could not be made or leveled against God. He felt their sufferings to a depth they would never know. His soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Amazing, isn't it, really, to think that God's people have the ability to emotionally affect God. Now, I'm, I'm being very careful what I'm saying here because the grieving is an emotion. And we read in the New Testament, grieve not the spirit of God whereby you're sealed to the day of redemption. And so I actually have the capacity of, as a child of God, of actually grieving the heart of God by my willfulness. Isn't that amazing? And you see something of it uh, this last Law's Day. I was speaking on the God of prodigals. And one of the things that, that I wanted people to see is that we often say the stories about the prodigal son. No, it's not. The father is mentioned twice as often as the son in that story. And really the story is of a God who's brokenhearted over the wayward choices of the prodigals. And it talks about when the son came back, the father's looking a great way off. I reckon he was out on his front porch every single day, scanning the horizon, looking for the return of the prodigal. And this is the heart of God. This is a God who is not cold and unfeeling. This is a God who is actually grieved, deeply grieved by the misery 
of Israel. It breaks his heart when people make these foolish choices and suffer the consequences. And God is not in any way indifferent. He could bear Israel's suffering no longer. So again, our hope does not resist in the sincerity of our repentance, but in the intensity of the Lord's compassion. It's very difficult for us to imagine how much Israel's misery moved the heart of God, but it did. And so it says that the children of Israel, uh, children of Ammon, verse 17, were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped at Mizpah. Because we said Mizpah, we've, we've seen it before in our study of uh, 1 Samuel. It means a watchtower or an outlook. It's obviously a, a place of high ground, uh, very key to watching the enemy. And so the children of Israel gather together to Mizpah, but they, they feel the lack of leadership. And so it says, the people and the princes of Gilead said one to another, what man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? In other words, we want a man to lead us. This is all preparing the way for Saul. We want a king like all the other nations. We want a man that will lead us. He shall be head over the inhabitants of Gilead. Have they not learned anything uh, from, uh, from the past? You know, this idea of making a dynasty. Uh, he'll be he'll be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. We'll make him king, so to see. We want to make this man king if he'll deliver us. And so, once again, the children of Israel, although the Lord is merciful, they're still foolish. And instead of crying to the Lord and saying, Lord, would you raise up a deliverer of your choice? They organized a committee to seek for a man. <laughs> now, let's find a man that can help us. And, of course, uh, they got a man, and the Lord used him in his mercy for the people of Israel. But, oh, if we could only learn that the place to turn to is not put our confidence in princes, not put our trust in men, but put our confidence in the Lord our God and look to him and him alone to bring deliverance from our captivity and our bondage. May God encourage us as we conclude this session. Amen.